<laughs> this is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Cat lovers and feline friends, it's time for Adele Park's Quirky Catnips. Today on the Quirky Cat Nips podcast, we're airing a chapter of Quirky Cat Gets Ghosted, which we will do until the entire audiobook has been broadcasted. We invite all you kitties to kick back now, relax, and enjoy Quirky Cat Gets Ghosted by Adele Park. Audio Recording St. George presents Quirky Cat Gets Ghosted. Written, produced, and edited by Adele Park. Narrated by a full cast. A directive from Gertrude Fletcher, head of the Naval Utah Department of Motor Vehicles. Part 6. I don't like cats. I do respect their ability to navigate precarious situations, however. Have you ever watched a cat weave through a shelf full of glass collectibles without disturbing a single one of them? Dogs, by comparison, bulldoze forward, happily knocking asunder anything within a tail's reach. Dogs may be man's best friend, but in the case of Blue McKenna, cats are her only hope for salvation. Blue dislikes cats even more than me, a feeling that is amplified in the case of one cat in particular, Skitters. I never had the displeasure of meeting Skitters when I still had a pulse. I try to avoid this oversized flea magnet in my current state as well. Blue can't afford the luxury of ghosting Skitters. He's the only one in her former sphere who can see her. Cats have always been attuned to the supernatural. Perhaps this is why there is a close association between felines and the occult. Have you ever seen a cat suddenly arch its back and hiss when there's no apparent threat? It happens a lot when Skitters finds himself in the vicinity of Blue. I take it this was a contentious relationship to begin with. Things haven't improved with Blue's passing. Calling upon skitters for assistance is tenuous at best. Unlike dogs, cats don't enjoy doing the bidding of humans. They have their own agendas. It takes a proper amount of nudging to compel felines to act, even when it is in their own best interest. Miss Kitty is one such example. I had already perished when Juniper Hollow was set ablaze following a domestic argument between a polygamist woman and her mobster husband. Two cats survived the fire, carried out of the flames by a mama kitty who later succumbed to smoke inhalation. Drawn to the commotion caused by the ruckus, I was on hand to prod Miss Kitty to climb to safety at the top of Granite Ridge. The other cat, one called Harriet, remained behind, waiting to connect with the polygamist child who once handled her. Both cats are still alive today, and both have been entangled with skitters. Pity this is what Blue is hanging her hat on to save her from an eternity of lurking around the division of motor vehicles. Next! In case you haven't noticed, you've been ghosted. Chapter 6 Skitters the Cat Hell to the no, stenchy wench, especially if you're going to peppy lapumi. Seriously, girl, you smell like a weak old pot of sulfur soup. Blue McKenna annoyed me in life. She positively galls me in death. This corpulescent bride of Frankenstein could never sleep with the fishes. They wouldn't have her down there. An entire ocean couldn't dilute her apocalyptic stink. Blue's body odor is so rancid, the food in my cat dish spoils the minute she shows up. Why does she keep coming around anyway? It's not like we're even frenemies. You have to like someone first to gain that status. Why then would I ever willingly commune with this putrid, vapor-belching cadaver? 
At first, I tried to ignore her. I could close my eyes and block out the ghastly shimmer that she's become, but not her scent. I'll bet you didn't know this, but a cat's sense of smell is 14 times better than a human's. What might smell like a whiff of B.O. to you is like working the floor of a fart factory to me. Even more troubling is the fact that I can hear every snide word Blue says. Say what? You're going for the talking cat, but you draw the line at a ghost. Suit yourself, sweetheart. I've got a whopper of a tail to wag so you can get off here if you don't like it. For those of you continuing on with our story, you may be wondering why Blue would waste time on a cat who would rather be at the vet's office having a thermometer crammed up its poop portal than hanging out with her. The answer is simple. I'm the only one open-minded enough to see what is right in front of me. The rest of Blue's lot is floating down a muddy river called Denial. Scotty Sphincter is as emotionally clamped down as his actual sphincter. Moon McKenna, Blue's twin, is unable to detect the sweaty crotch odor that now defines her sister thanks to copious amounts of a lotion called Almond Sunrise. I wish I didn't know this because it implies a level of intimacy that will never happen when it comes to me and Blue. Before she sweltered into the boiled egg gone south that she is today, Blue reeked of Almond Sunrise. It was a lotion Moon manufactured exclusively for her. Perhaps under different circumstances, I would have enjoyed this organically tropical scent because it was associated with a woman who deserved every torment I could drag her way, I detested it. Now that Moon has suddenly taken to wearing Almond Sunrise, I try to avoid her too. That's working out a whole lot better than dodging the left-in-the-sun Limburger cheese that floats around in Blue's wedding dress. What's up with those cowboy boots? I asked, hoping to get under her skin, or whatever it is she has these days. There was no sense in acting like Blue wasn't around. The milk in my dish was curdling into rank, dingy strips of pale gunk. When Blue didn't respond, I realized it took a lot of energy for her to talk. She wasn't going to waste it telling me what a putz I am. Blue's opinions of me didn't matter when she was doing the mattress mambo wearing nothing but those boots, and they definitely don't now that she's dead. Just as a side note, Blue and Scotty really got their freak on when it came to her white cowboy boots. Cats see things, you know? I've been neutered, but I can still work up a wad of jizz at important times like this. I sauntered over to the glistening, slime-colored image and let loose. Excellent execution on the spray, if I do say so myself. It was like it erased her. For a second, the misty green mess disappeared altogether. Satisfied, I turned around and nearly jumped out of my fabulous fur coat when I discovered Blue's face about three centimeters from my nose. Then she did the unthinkable. She opened her mouth and aimed a stream of breath at me that was so virulent I nearly passed out. It felt like she'd clubbed me between the eyes with a bottle of warm pee. Revolted, I inched away, arching my back. By this point, my fur was standing up so straight, Blue could have turned me over and used me like a saddle brush. What she did instead was much worse. She slithered even closer, exhaling another tide of radioactive air. What the hell do you want, you rotting, heartless swamp dragon? I was crying actual tears. Not because I was sad. Blue's breath had an industrial-strength ammonia quality to it that scorched my eyeballs. For a minute, Blue seemed to be fading. I felt a small flicker of hope. Then she roared back and dropped a verbal load of napalm on me with these two words, Juniper Hollow. No further explanation was needed. Not that Blue was capable in that moment anyway. The effort caused her to fade into near nothingness. The aftermath of that two-word sentence, delivered with the power of an assault rifle loaded with stink pellets, 
hung in the air like venomous gun smoke. There are two things I know for sure. One, I loathe Blue McKenna on a scale beyond measure. Two, there is definitely something nefarious happening at Juniper Hollow, although I don't consider Blue's death to be one of them. I inadvertently spent the night at Juniper Hollow after Jasper Stratton hosted his grand opening for Regenerant, his vitamin company. I like to get out and about, especially for big events like this one. I'm simply not content to stay home and lick myself all day. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Fortunately, Moon is accustomed to letting me tag along whenever it suits my stripedy goodness. On this particular day, Blue was with us, which put a damper on an otherwise delightful affair. The spread coming out of the kitchens at Juniper Hollow were scrump delicious. Chicken salad sandwiches on many croissants, individual pork pies, salmon, and fresh shrimp by the bucketful. I generally don't go for sweets, but the strawberry cream puffs they laid out like little pink dominoes knocked me over. My girlfriend, Miss Kitty, lives in a cabin on Granite Ridge, giving her a bird's-eye view of Juniper Hollow. She was there for the big party, but she didn't arrive with her handler, Boyd Fletcher. Miss Kitty never gets to go anywhere with Boyd except to the vet. I don't know how she can stand this sort of cruel imprisonment. I'd try to bust her out, except Miss Kitty seems truly fond of the old crank. Maybe that's because Boyd took her in when the previous owners of Juniper Hollow lit the place on fire to cover up what, most people say, was a murder. Miss Kitty belonged to said victim and was nearing starvation when Boyd found her. Since that time, Miss Kitty has blossomed into what can politely be called a full-figured feline. She's even bigger than me. Despite all the fat shaming I endured from Blue, I'm hardly what you call grotesquely obese. And if anyone ever uses either of those words to describe Miss Kitty, I'll pinch a loaf into their shoe. I'm not kidding. Just ask Blue. I did her the favor of making sure she never wore those dowdy black flats again. Too bad I couldn't engineer a sloppy turd drop into her white cowboy boots. Hang tight, kitties. We'll be back in a scratch. Can't wait to hear the rest of Quirky Cat Gets Ghosted by Adele Park? Get ghosted today on Audible, Spotify, and Barnes & Noble. Meow, bitches. I really don't like audiobooks, but this one kicks ass. Let's Talk Pets. Let's Talk Pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com <laughs> Getting back to Juniper Hollow. Miss Kitty met me on the backside of a three-story tower they call the Residence. I wondered if Jasper Stratton and his zoned-out wife lifted this term from the White House. True, the Residence at Juniper Hollow is white, but these two probably don't even vote. A gray flagstone patio surrounds the entire Residence, with a common plaza connecting it to the Regenerant plant. I was happy to discover the kitchen in the Regenerant building was directly across from the kitchen on the east side of the residence. This meant the doors to both buildings were propped open, giving Miss Kitty and I easy access to either place. Most of the hot food was coming out of the residence kitchen, including a load of tot-sized pepperoni pizzas. Pepperoni makes me gassy with a heartburn after effect, but it has a special place in my food memory. Pepperoni pizza was the first thing I was given to eat after I got my paw flattened by a car. The lady who smushed it didn't have any cat food. I had been living in a parking garage, so that greasy Italian ulcer maker went down like a Sunday morning. Most people have no idea what it's like to be hungry. For this reason, I absolutely refuse to be bullied about my body. You got a problem with my size or Miss Kitty's glorious full figure? Go fuck yourself with a giant nightstick, because obviously you need to dislodge whatever it is you have shoved up your shanker. Moving on, Miss Kitty and I spent a delectable afternoon quietly darting between the two kitchens. 
There were so many people gawking and gobbling, no one noticed us. Miss Kitty did get a little spooked when her handler, Boyd, showed up. We'd been foraging for hours and couldn't reasonably pack in another bite, although I tried. Miss Kitty split for Granite Ridge, hoping to make it back before Boyd. She gets free run of the ridge, but Boyd gets stressed when he spots her roaming around at Juniper Hollow. And he's always looking. Boyd's got a pair of high-powered binoculars that could detect a freckle on the butt of an ant. Moon and her moronic sister, Blue, seemed to be settled in for the day, staying way longer than it should have taken to learn all there is to know about how to stuff vitamins into plastic bottles. By mid-afternoon, the pepperoni pizzas were making me woozy. I wasn't quite through with them, however, so I snuggled in for a little shut-eye in a dark corner of a laundry room on the first floor of the residence. I was feeling a tad delirious from all the food and slept longer than I planned. It was dark when I woke up. The doors leading outside were no longer propped open. Fantastic! I ate myself into an afternoon coma, and now my ride back to Gecko's Gulch was gone. No way I wanted to walk home in this condition. Better to show up on the doorstep of Boyd's cabin and have him call Moon. Her twin daughters would be losing their sweet little minds worrying about where I'd gotten off to. All I had to do was figure out how to get out of the residence. Without getting caught. It wasn't the humans I was afraid of. They'd probably just open a door and scat me out. It was the damn dog. Cupcake. This yapping ball of albino pubic hair was anything but sweet. A real insult to cupcakes, especially the little yellow ones with lemon frosting I had during the open house. They were almost as good as the strawberry puff pastries. Cupcake didn't mingle with the crowd during the big regenerant revival. He was locked up on the third floor, baying like a drunken donkey. In between snatching goodies from the kitchen, Miss Kitty and I took the liberty of exploring the residence, quickly figuring out Cupcake was stashed in a corner room next to a large bedroom suite. I know this because we basically had free run of the place. Just to crank the albino Brillo pad, I made a big show of begging Cupcake to join us for the party. Of course, this drove the spastic yipster out of his screeching, pea-sized mind. Miss Kitty's handler spends so much time snooping on Juniper Hollow, I already knew Cupcake had a doggy door going out to the balcony on the east side of the residence. Walkout balconies wrap around both the second and third floors with varying degrees of outdoor amenities. The one where they kept Cupcake had white, wrought iron patio furniture with pink and white striped seat covers, fake trees bursting with pastel flowers, and a pee pad. Yup, that's right, Cupcake lives in a phony ice cream parlor and pees on a pad. No wonder he's such a bitch. The door to Cupcake's room was closed during the party, so I didn't see what kind of digs he has. He was locked up in the suite where his owner, Kelly Stratton, lays her bottle blonde head each night. I noticed Cupcake was kept away from the room with the doggy door, leading to the bulbous pink patio where Kelly chain smokes, while resting her sculpted butt on seat cushions designed by Baskin Robbins. Not hard to understand why Kelly drugs herself to infinity and beyond. Boyd Fletcher spends so much time keeping tabs on the happenings at Juniper Hollow that I'm familiar with the layout of the place. I've seen Boyd taking pictures or peering in with his government-issue binoculars on numerous occasions. Miss Kitty fills me in on the rest. Basically, the place is top-heavy with young female employees. On the weekends, the testosterone tribe helicopters in. The vitamin business may be legit, although you have to question why Jasper deliberately staffed it with polygamists. I'm not buying his garbage about giving back to the blighted community which discarded him like a soiled diaper filled with salty gruel. Jasper used to be on the inside. He was born to view women as commodities.
The bug that crawled up Boyd's butt and was madly buzzing around has to do with the landing pad for the helicopter on top of the residence. True, Juniper Hollow isn't easy to reach, especially if you're coming from a place like Las Vegas or St. George, Utah. But who can't put in a two-hour drive? According to Jasper, the helicopter is used to bring investors and board members to Juniper Hollow for meetings. Jasper greased a whole lot of palms to get the permit for the helipad. Boyd hollered himself hoarse at the zoning meetings, only to be swatted away like an annoying gnat. The Pitt County Commissioners were thrilled to finally have the mob gone from Juniper Hollow. Polygamous, they could handle. All they did was rip off the federal government, which, in the religiously sterile minds of the Pitt County Commissioners, wasn't such a bad thing so long as the con didn't get local. Besides, the welfare scam that relocated more than a dozen men from Zion Flats to the Gray Bar Motel cleaned up the mess considerably. As for Jasper, all indications are he doesn't give two farts and a poop about religion. You won't catch Jasper darkening the doors of any church, either in Zion Flats or Naval. Jasper's comments to the Naval Weekly banner about helping those affected by the plight of polygamy fell on deaf ears. The people in Pitt County care about their polygamous neighbors about as much as Congress cares about meaningful gun control. So, Jasper's got pligs filling vitamin bottles at Regenerant, girls in pale pink dress uniforms cleaning imaginary dust at the residence, and a posse of young, muscle-bound Turks arriving by helicopter on the weekends. They stay on the second floor of the residence. In the mornings, you can see them on the covered balcony pumping weights and sweating spooge. Spending the night in the residence felt like it took a lifetime. The door leading to Cupcake's ice cream parlor pee pad area was shut. Same with the door to Jasper and Kelly's room. I needed to take a dump. I know for a fact my shit doesn't stink because I've made it a point to smell it. Nonetheless, I have my pride to think about. Time to wake up Cupcake. All it took was a few scratches on the door to get that dingy pot scrubber to commence with the yowling. There's only one door leading to the Pepto-Bismol pink patio. Cupcake was practically having a seizure now that he knew I was around. It took longer than I would have expected for Kelly to tend to this early morning assault to the ears. At one point, Jasper yelled something, followed by a thunk where a shoe was chucked against a wall. Moments later, the door to the master suite opened and Kelly timidly crept into the thickly carpeted hallway. What the heck? Did she go to sleep with makeup on? How was it possible for her hair to be so perfectly coiffed? Kelly was wrapped in a bathrobe made from about 40 yards of fluffy pink material. She looked like a Cupid doll ensconced in a giant loofah. Her toenails, pink with tiny white polka dots, poked out from a pair of bedroom slippers festooned with what looked like the feathers from the rump of a flamingo. Jesus, lady, enough with the pink already. I slunk back against the wall in the hallway when Kelly came out of the suite looking like she was walking the red carpet at an awards show for zombies. The lights weren't on in the hallway or Kelly's maybe it's Maybelline head. I only had a couple of seconds to dart into the escape room. Despite being denser than a load of lead pipes, Cupcake saw me and spastically lunged in my direction. Anticipating this move? I leapt to higher ground, taking refuge on top of a glass display case. Cupcake was quick on my heels, snarling and baying. I took a quick look around. Jeepers creepers! The entire room was filled with cases just like the one I was perched on. Why the long face, you ask? Well, how do you feel about demon dolls? What I saw in this room looked like the malignant spirit of every sinister doll movie ever made times a hundred thousand. There wasn't a beach blanket Barbie among them. Display cases, like the one I was resting my hiney on, lined all four walls. Every shelf was packed with old-fashioned dolls, all with those unsettling hand-painted faces. Creepy!
Despite her dreamlike state, Kelly was quick to unlock the doggy door, no doubt trying to keep her pathetic pee pad devotee from waking up the entire residence. I leapt from my spot on the display case, wishing I had time to spray some of those hideous dolls on my way out. Cupcake was so worked up, I actually beat him out the door. Did I see some heinous child slave operation during my stay at the residence? No, I didn't see any kids at all. Some of the pink ladies with dust mops looked young, but not like jailbait tenderloins. Nor were there any torture chambers, sex dungeons, or meth labs. Yet, I had to agree with Blue, there was something nefarious happening here. The question buggering me now was what did this satchel of smelly green ghost glop expect me to do about it? I suppose I could actually listen when Boyd Fletcher gets his tuna trawler in a twirl about Juniper Hollow. I'm up on Granite Ridge with my twin handlers at least a couple of times a month. Problem is, this arrangement may be coming to a sad end. I'll still see Miss Kitty. No one in the Tri-County region would be allowed to sleep if I missed my cat courting. The question is, who will take me to visit? The citizens of Naval are the human version of Kelly's pink parlor monstrosity, tackiness covered in cotton candy. These Mormon soul scrotums are not the innocent Napoleon dynamites I once thought of them as. With only a week left in the school year, my twin handlers came home from school asking their parents what a faggot was and why a group of fourth graders said their dad was one. By the next day, plans were being made to hustle the twins out of here. Maybe even permanently. Even before this happened, the twins were scheduled to spend a month at summer camp. The faggot fandango extended that to at least the whole summer. If their dad Randall gets his way, they may move to California. I heard it's hella fun there, but that really doesn't do a cat any good. I have Miss Kitty to think about. We're quite an item if you haven't caught on to that yet. Moon is staying behind this summer, supposedly to do repairs on Gecko's Gulch. Since Moon slinks around like she's a ghost herself, I don't envision her making much progress. Lately, Moon has been about as empty-headed as Kelly the ookie doll hoarder. I get it. Moon is sad that Blue is gone. And her mother-in-law kicked the bucket just a few months before her sister. Nonetheless, the vacant lot growing dandelions in Moon's head makes her of no use to anyone. When it comes to Randall, he's boinking a young lawyer working to overturn the ban on gay marriage in California. This faggot situation in Naval is just pushing him further out the door. I've even heard Randall talking about putting his salon, the best little hair house in Naval, up for sale. Without putting it in actual words, since that's like trying to pry a buck from J. Paul Getty, Blue let me know she's going to stalk me until I help her figure out why she crashed into the piling on the bridge at Juniper Hollow. I would just ignore her. But there's no brushing off the overflowing septic tank smell. Miss Kitty has agreed to sneak back in the residence for another look, so that might make for an interesting afternoon. What rams a hot poker up my pee hole is the fact that Blue left this whole thing up to me. No wonder I can't stand her. One good quirk leads to another. If you're enjoying Quirky Cat Gets Ghosted, you should pounce over to audible.com and snag yourself a download of Quirky Cat Goes Splat by Adele Park. Splat is the story of two twitchy teenagers who team up with Skitters the Cat to raise holy hell. Quirky Cat Goes Splat. It's the cat's meow. Get Splat today on audible.com. Let's Talk Pets. Every week, on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.